Hello, and welcome to the webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Noe Santos with the Bureau of Reclamation, and we are very pleased to have Mark Briggs, Mark Kybe, and Amanda Webb presenting today. Mark Kybe is the Deputy Regional Fire Management Coordinator with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest Region in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mark began his career in fire as an Arizona Hotshot crew member for the U.S. Fish Forest Service in 1982. He was a hotshot superintendent and also worked in Alaska with Native American crews. Mark has traveled extensively and also worked overseas in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and throughout Africa where he studied Native people's traditional resource use. Mark attended graduate school where his research in the Southwest of Mexico included a multidisciplinary approach to reconstruct differences in forest fire histories and cultural patterns using tree ring evidence, documentary sources, and ethnographical methods. His current job includes application of fire science and experience to wildfire and prescribed fire management on national wildlife re refugees. Mark Briggs is a senior program officer for the World Wildlife Fund, is a restoration ecologist on, on WWF's global freshwater team, and leads binational efforts as part of WWF's Rio Grande Bravo Basin program. Briggs has worked on river restoration and conservation efforts on a variety of rivers in the U.S. and Mexico, including the Colorado River and Delta, Santa Cruz River, Little Colorado River, Gila River, Rio Conchos, and Rio Grande slash Rio Bravo. Briggs also conducts workshops on river restoration in both Mexico and the United States, has numerous publications, and sits on the editorial board of the International Journal of Restoration Ecology. Amanda Webb is a research specialist with the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative at the University of Arizona, where she provides technical and project management support for Desert LCC collaborative projects data collection, data management, and science delivery and communication projects. Previously, Amanda worked on multiple research, conservation, and recreation projects in Arizona, the U.S. Mexico border region, Virginia, Arkansas, and California. All combined, Amanda has over a decade of experience in natural resources, management, and ecological research in federal, economic, and nonprofit sectors. At the University of Arizona, Amanda studies watershed management, plant ecology, and fire ecology in repairing ecosystems. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you to the presenters for sharing us this work with us. I'm now going to turn it over to Mark Briggs to begin the presentation. Mark? Uh, great. Noe, thank you uh, for the intro and uh, for this opportunity, and, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining us here. Um, this is Mark Briggs, and I'll be, I'll be uh, co-sharing uh, uh, this presentation with my uh, two co-authors, uh, Kybe and, and uh, Amanda Webb, who will be uh, jumping in at strategic points to either save me or um, focus on specific parts of this presentation. Hopefully, uh, we can do this uh, between the three of us as uh, smoothly as possible. And I was volunteered to to uh, to take the lead on this, and uh, but uh, it was a uh, it was definitely a uh, co-sharing event between the three of us. Uh, so the uh, title is Smoke on the Water, and we're, this was came out of the work that we did as part of uh, our efforts on CMQ5 related to changing fire regimes in riparian ecosystems of uh, western U.S. and northern Mexico. Essentially, uh, what we're looking at riparian ecosystems in um, in the greater desert LCC ecoregion. So the presentation focus uh, for today is to, to uh, take a look at the CMQ-5 objectives and summarize uh, some of the results and um, potential next steps. Uh, it occurred to me as, as I was doing this, I was sort of assuming that probably most of you on the phone today are aware of the you know CMQ process, Desert LCC, et cetera, but just taking a quick step back, uh, CMQ is the critical management questions, and there are six teams in total that the uh, Desert LCC put together to help guide their uh, priorities in the uh, Desert uh, LCC ecoregion. And um, uh, Mark and uh, Mark Ibe and Amanda Webb and I sat on CMQ five. And the essentially the central goal of EM5 was to address uh, key knowledge gaps as best we could associated with changing riparian fire regimes. So that was that was the uh, focus of our work. 
we had a lot of people come in and out of our team of uh, come in and out and contribute to the CMQ five process. Just a few of them I listed here from my notes, and there are others. So if you're online and you contributed, please forgive me for, for not adding your name there. There's a lot of great conversations that we've had, meetings, et cetera, over the course of the last few years on a variety of things dealing with fire in riparian areas and conservation, et cetera. And uh, this, this is just a, a quick list of some of those who contributed. Um, so just setting the stage for uh, the CMQ-5, you know, why, why was it felt um, by Desert LCC at all uh, that we needed to focus on, uh, that one of the critical management question teams should focus on fire regimes in, um, in riparian areas? Uh, so just taking a step back, sort of setting the stage for, for answering that, and this is, I'm sure, really quickly things that all of us on the phone know, but uh, important to set the context anyway. I mean, we all know, or at least, you know, I think we know that riparian ecosystems, their, their streams, bottom land, ecosystems, et cetera, are really critical. They're, they're critical not only for many species of aquatic and riparian wildlife and terrestrial as well, um, but provide uh, a lot of ecosystem services that go well beyond their, their spatial extent. We also know uh, that the streams in the western U.S., uh, you know, we can really say this throughout the world, but since we're looking at, um, for the large part, the western U.S. and northern Mexico, have been impacted by a, a variety of human activities uh, agri in, in the arid parts of the world, and the desert LCC ecoregion certainly is that. Uh, these stream systems have been impacted by uh, agriculture and, and uh, growing thirsty uh, populations, uh, impoundment, fragmentation, uh, invasive species, et cetera. So a lot of impacts are taking place, and many of these streams have um, been greatly altered over the course of the last 100 years or more. We also know that, uh, that particularly as we look at some of these arid, uh, semi-arid watersheds, Colorado River, Rio Grande, uh, Yaqui Basin, the Conchos, um, that many of these basins are over allocated, uh, in some cases significantly so. So as water comes down from the mountains um, through natural contributions from snow and rain and makes its way to the desert floor and then ultimately to the sea, um, there simply is not a lot left for, for river ecosystems. And that plays a huge part as we look at how the systems are altered and changing fire regimes. The, as a result of all the uh, uh, physical changes and sediment and, uh, and water, the physical template of a lot of these streams has significantly changed. And in a lot of cases, this has led to uh, significant invasions of uh, invasive species. An example here of the Rio Grande Bravo downstream of San Vicente Canyon, dominated by uh, Arundo Donax and, and Phragmites. In some cases, uh, the biomass in uh, riparian ecosystems today is much greater than it was previously because of the lack of uh, or great reduction in peak flows during the spring and, and uh, summer monsoonal seasons as a result of reservoirs and river impoundment. And this has led to kind of a, a trickling of water through a lot of these systems as compared to what it was in the past. These systems are no longer scoured out. And you put on top of that some of these highly invasive species like cane here, but you know you can also substitute uh, in the blanks Russian olive and, and salt cedar, uh, et cetera. The biomass is, uh, has grown significantly along many of these rivers, and, and this is also contributing to changing fire regimes in some of these bottom land systems. We also note that the climate is changing, and this is uh, contributed uh, greatly to uh, changing uh, fire regimes in other ecosystems and, uh, and has also contributed to uh, changing hydrologic conditions along many of our streams um, and has compounded the problem. We also know that, um, or are beginning to become much more aware that uh, the fire regimes in non-bottomland ecosystems are 
are changing. They are occurring with greater frequency and severity than they seem to have in the past. There's uh, significantly more acreage being burned today, for example, in the western U.S. than has been recorded at least, uh, at least back to uh, several decades. This is a, some data that uh, was compiled by the National Interagency Fire Center, and um, you can see the growing acreage of, uh, of uh, areas burned across the western U.S. And the last, uh, the eight greatest uh, uh, burning years took place over the last uh, 15 years. So. And so if you take all the above and you put it together, um, it is, uh, it seems pretty obvious that uh, the fire regimes also in bottomland ecosystems or riparian ecosystems is also changing. These, all these factors are combining to um, potentially change in a significant manner how these systems uh, are being burned at the severity and frequency. Hey, Mark, I might add to that. Um, this is Mark Kaib, and, and one of the other factors in really trying to en enhance folks' awareness about the, the change that we're seeing in these systems is historically the land management agencies uh, involved with these river systems, their mission is tied more closely to the politics of water. Um, the Interstate Stream Commissions, the Bureau of Reclamation, it hasn't been until the last decade or so that really more interest has, has been brought to bear on the ecological values and ecosystem services that these systems provide. And so that's one of the things that we've been trying to lead with CMQ-5 as well. Great, Mark. Thanks. Great point. Um, so this led uh, to not only the formation of uh, the, and the importance for, for forming the CMQ-5 team, um, but uh, that kind of uh, background also led us to developing the, uh, the, the questions that we focused on since the formation. So these are a few of the questions that uh, were, were central to Q5 mission. Um, so we had our, we kind of divided up in two parts. We had a critical management question and then kind of a, a following question. So we labeled it kind of 5.1, 5.2. But uh, um, so the main question were, uh, what are the trends in wildfire events? So frequency, size. Uh, seasonality severity over the last uh, 40 years or so for riparian ecosystems in the desert LCC ecoregion. So that was one question. And uh, what are the magnitude and scale of the impacts on, on stream biophysical chemical characteristics as well as the ecosystem services? So are these systems, are the fire regimes in riparian ecosystems changing? And if so, to what extent? And, and, to, uh, and what impacts have uh, changing fire regimes had on these systems. So that was one part of the, the question that we had. And the second part was if we can say hypothetically that uh, the fire regimes are indeed changing in uh, these riparian ecosystems, you know, what is the so what? Why, why should we care about that? And that led to the sort of the second group of questions, which uh, dealing with um, what kinds of land stewardship practices can be used to reduce um, undesirable effects of wildland fires in riparian ecosystems, and also how might prescribed fire be used to meet uh, management objectives um, along streams domi dominated by non-native plants. So those are two other uh, questions. So the four questions sort of compiled the central um, questions that CMQ-5 was dealing with and uh, led to the formation of, of our priorities. So over the course of uh, the first couple of years, and, and my memory is, uh, so Amanda and <laughs> Kai, you can jump in here, but my memory is that we started talking about a lot of stuff back in, in 2011, and it was a kind of uh, a lot of meetings and uh, calls, et cetera, over the course of a couple of years. And I think this took place generally with all the um, critical management question teams. 
But um, CM25, we came up with with uh, six uh, main priorities, and I'll just go through them real quick here. We wanted to conduct a literature review on changing fire regimes in riparian ecosystems as a as a main first step to see what else has been done. Uh, we wanted to work, as, as with all the critical management question teams, we wanted to work with the Desert LCC in general to guide the support of science to address some of the priorities that we are coming up with, and in, in our case, it was those related to changing riparian fire regimes. We wanted to develop a, a database of demonstration sites. Uh, these are uh, bottomland sites that had either, either experienced um, severe fire events or ones where prescribed fire was being used, and we wanted to use those uh, demonstration sites and, and other sources to identify uh, best management practices related to reducing the effects of severe fire. Uh, we also uh, wanted to look into how, uh, based on what was already occurring in the desert LCC ecoregion, to um, to take advantage of ongoing private-public partnership uh, projects, um, and uh, and in, and do what we can to enhance uh, to continue the momentum of those projects and enhance collaboration. And six, and finally, um, monitoring it is absolutely essential to figuring out not only uh, where and to what extent frequency, et cetera, some of these bottomland riparian fires are occurring but the impact of those fires on, on resources. So those are our six priorities. Uh, we're going to tackle a few kind of, on, uh, of uh, results of what we did um, with those priorities. The first thing that we did was a literature review. This was done by Amanda uh, Webb as part of her master's thesis. And I'm just going to hand it over to Amanda right now. Great. Thank you, Mark. So yes, I've been working on this literature review of fire in lowland riparian ecosystems of the southwestern U.S. and Mexico. And the purpose of the literature review is really to assess, summarize, and synthesize the state of the knowledge of changing fire regimes in these ecosystems and fire effects on vegetation and abiotic ecosystem components. And of course, we're also interested in looking at prescribed fire effects and post-fire rehabilitation. And so today, I'm really going to just focus on giving you all sort of a broad brush um, assessment of the state of the knowledge. And I think that kind of helps us start to identify where some of the information gaps um, are. So here is a list of the literature search databases that I use. Um, during a systematic search uh, looking for literature about these subjects. And we were most specifically interested in uh, literature sources where the study area or area of interest fell within the desert LCC. And we were interested in lowland systems. So to make that easy, I uh, selected study areas or areas of interest uh, where the repairing ecosystems were looked at at elevation at or below 5,000 feet. But perhaps most importantly, uh, we were really focused on finding information on fire that is occurring in the riparian corridor. So I found a total of 60 literature sources that discuss fire in these ecosystems. Um, this includes observational studies, experiments, uh, technical reports, field reports. We were really uh, aiming to be very inclusive in the types of literature that uh, we included. And here you can see out of 60 native plants and fire made up 28 of the literature sources, non-native plants 27, and abiotic uh, 11. So clearly those numbers don't add up to 60, but there's uh, some overlap there, as in some sources discuss more than one of these subjects um, within a single paper. Uh, but the point here is, um, that there are a relatively low number of papers looking at um, the physical components of the riparian ecosystem, this abiotic part. And so um, that is uh, potentially a concern because, of course, the physical environment is what is setting the stage for vegetation, which then, of course, becomes 
fuel for fire. And so the other point I want to make is that um, most of the study areas uh, were in the United States. Uh, I only found two literature sources um, about this subject in Mexico. And then those two other ones are uh, from Australia and South Africa. Generally, uh, the, the results of the literature review do support the idea that fire frequency and or severity are increasing in multiple riparian areas in the desert LCC. Um, but we still fall short of really having a good picture of the full extent of this issue. Um, and there's a lot to unpack here um, that we'll have to save for a later conversation. But I just wanted to include these two photographs to help remind everybody that no two fires are the same. And um, fire behavior and subsequent fire effects are very much dependent on uh, specific conditions and time and place. Uh, so here we have fire and native vegetation. Uh, cottonwood and willow uh, were grouped together, uh, 23 sources about that. That uh, includes mostly uh, Fremont cottonwood, Rio Grande cottonwood, including willow, and uh, mesquite, again, focusing uh, specifically on areas within uh, repairing corridors. Here is a summary of information about fire and non-native plants. Uh, we had the most literature sources on tamarisk, um, most accessible or perhaps most written about species. Uh, some studies from Russian olive, um, these mainly came out of the middle Rio Grande. And um, the rest of these species uh, are rather uh, much less information available on. Finally, here's a general breakdown of um, the, the literature resources available on fire and abiotic ecosystem components kind of give you an idea of um, what kinds of information we found um, through um, on those subjects. And so again, this is just a brief overview. Uh, we're continuing to work on a manuscript that we plan to submit as a general technical report uh, with the US Forest Service. And also, I'll be presenting more uh, on this research at an upcoming fire ecology conference in Tucson. So if any of you are planning on uh, Attending that, please feel free to come say hi. Thank you. Back to you, Mark. All right, Amanda, great. Thank you uh, for that uh, summary. It, anybody have any questions at this point? Uh, we, maybe we just save the questions for later, but uh, please uh, feel free to chime in as we move forward here. Um, so the other part, uh, the other priority that, uh, of the CMTU uh, that came out of our discussions of the SUMQ5 was to guide uh, some of the science related to fire regimes in, in riparian ecosystems and um, to guide some of the, uh, the RFP process that the Desert LCC was initiating. And so along with CMQ1, which was also associated uh, with um, bottom land ecosystems, I think mostly on the aquatic part of it, we guided uh, um, or at least identified some of the science priorities to uh, better understand the magnitude, at least on our part, the scale of wildfires in riparian regimes. And we developed, or at least helped develop some of the RFPs that were connected with this. We wanted to focus some of the science as best we could, or at least steer it towards um, some, of the, some of the river systems uh, listed here, including the Colorado, Gila, Rio Grande, the Yaki. Uh, this is just a sample of some of the uh, studies, bottom land associated studies that were uh, funded, at least uh, a lot of them were funded by Bureau of Reclamation, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, it was through the Desert LCC, at least in part the Desert LCC process. I think uh, on this webinar series, many of these have been uh, summarized, but it's a nice, a nice list, and there are, of course, others. This is just a... Uh, a sample. The other uh, priority that we wanted to take on as part of the CMQ-5 was to uh, identify sites that we attentively called uh, demonstration sites, uh, sites, bottom line sites where uh, severe fires have occurred and or where prescribed fire was being used as part of, of management to, to accomplish uh, specific management objectives. And we developed criteria for identifying some of these sites. We, we did focus on a lot of the rivers that I just uh, 
uh, list uh, that I just listed in the other um, slide. But uh, some of the criteria for identifying potential sites included uh, the sites uh, should be representative of larger areas, that there's some type of collaborative science management actions that are underway, there's potential or they already involve innovative partnerships, particularly between the private public sector. Uh, there is some level of that tangible work. Work is ongoing that this, you know, we're, we wanted to not so much avoid, but give lower priority sites that are, you know, done kind of one and out type of thing. So ongoing work um, and ongoing work that had some kind of existing baseline data set uh, with, uh, and again, where recent fire or uh, wildfires have occurred or prescribed fire is taking place and where some level of monitoring is occurring. So um, second, my mouse, uh, there we go. This, um, the demonstration, um, the list of demonstration sites overlaps significantly, at least with regard to the Rio Grande Bravo Basin with another effort that is underway that the Desert LCC and World Wildlife Fund others are involved in, which is the um, Rio Grande Rio Bravo Water Forum, which is scheduled to take place uh, February of next year. And as part of working towards the forum, there's a, an effort which we kind of coined the opportunity mapping effort, which is taking place throughout the Rio Grande Basin. The idea of the opportunity mapping effort and the Rio Grande Forum is to bring together um, folks that are working throughout the basin on water and, um, and uh, stream conservation projects and bring them into one room and see what they're doing, uh, lessons learned, that type of thing. And so the opportunity mapping effort is uh, an effort uh, ahead of the forum to identify folks working throughout the basin. So this is in Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, as well as uh, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Tamaulipas. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's going to be, as a result of this opportunity mapping effort, a pretty large database that's being formed of folks working, at least in part, the database will cover folks working in bottomland ecosystems, and again, at least in part, uh, on, on on efforts that deal directly or indirectly with, with fire. And so a lot of this effort that we started talking about as part of CMQ5 started to overlap with some of the opportunity mapping efforts taking place here. And, and one, of the, one of the challenges that we'll have in the future is um, to not only uh, be able to take advantage of the work being done ahead of the forum, but begin to piece, piece it out so that we can uh, look at specific have the information we need to, to look at specific parts of the basin where, where work that match our objectives are taking place, as well as to expand the database to include other parts of the desert LCC ecoregion, particularly uh, the Colorado Basin. The other priority uh, that we identified was inventory and monitoring. Um, the need is pretty clear and, and, and self-evident, but in, in order to really understand not only what is going on in bottom land ecosystems, riparian ecosystems associated with uh, changing fire regime, but uh, how a changing fire regime in these systems uh, might be impacting their biophysical chemical uh, characteristics as well as the ecosystem services they provide really requires long-term monitoring. We need to uh, have systems in place where the changes that occur along a river system uh, as a result of fire can be quantified over the long term. Um, the, the, in terms of, of the strategy, it seems uh, that the what and how are pretty well documented, you know, in terms of of what actually needs to be monitored and the protocols for monitoring it are fairly well documented. You have uh, um, collaborations, for example, between the Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service on inventory and monitoring and a ton of other literature out there on, on monitoring systems that are already in place. But the big missing pieces are the where, who, and support is, is, is where should these long-term monitoring sites be established. Um, and and who will actually do the monitoring? 
and and the big one is is how will it be supported this has been since I have been involved in natural resource conservation going back way too long um, monitoring is always held up as a piece that is not supported and uh, or at least not supported enough and the desert LCC seems to be in a great position to potentially drive uh, um, some of this support as part of the demonstration sites and the monitoring we tentatively identified several teams we uh, that we reached out to that could begin uh, to be put on a list as as uh, having long-term monitoring in in place that where where fire has been used uh, where severe fire has occurred or where prescribed burning is taking place uh, these are, are put here uh, on in yellow um, so we have like the Colorado River Delta. There's a few sites along the lower Colorado River, um, just upstream of the international border. The San Pedro River, uh, just downstream <coughs> of the international border. The upper Rio Grande uh, in between Santa Fe and Albuquerque has uh, some interesting efforts taking place that at least were initiated as results of fear fires on the upper parts. The Rio Conchos, the upper parts of the Rio Conchos, and uh, the Rio Bravo uh, in through along the international border in Big Bend. Um, so our hope is to expand on this list and then, like I was talking about before, uh, begin to augment it with some of the, um, with the database we're developing as part of the Rio Grande, uh, Rio Bravo forum. Hey, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Mark Kybe, I, I wanted to fill in a little uh, gap um, that, that relates to inventory monitoring, and it's kind of going back to some of the biophysical changes we're seeing in these systems. So this is a great map um, that shows some of the major river systems that we're talking about, but um, with the lack of flooding, environmental flows, overbank flooding, and moist soils, we, it, we see that that's together with the climate warming is really driving the spread of exotic species in these systems and a change in the fuels. So um, many of these exotic invasives are more fire adapted like the tamarisk and they're also more flammable. Um, compounding that is without the water and the moist soil, you don't get the microbial and detritivore activity that used to break down the fuels historically. So this is another reason to really pursue more wetland areas and, and moist soils and overbank flooding is that helps break down these heavy fuel loads that are driving these changes in the fire regimes. To add to that, um, we're starting to see an increase in large uh, cane grasses and bunch grasses that are completely altering these landscapes, converting them to a more monoculture and a grassland fire regime, more frequent fire regime. So I think the, the, the very good case study there is the lower Colorado River that's basically been completely converted to a cane grass system um, with very frequent fire, most of the native species have, have fallen out of, of that lower Colorado River. You don't see cottonwoods and willows except farther north um, are little, little patches of them. So um, what we really want to look for quantifying through more inventory and monitoring and research is really looking at the cascading effects of these significant um, ecosystem changes that we're seeing. Uh, the Lower Colorado River um, is an indication that, of what we might see in these other river systems, uh, the Middle Rio Grande, the Gila, the Salt, the Verde, um, that we've identified. So um, having better quantifiable data on those trends and then working together with these demonstration sites and, and the local community there, scientists and land managers, to develop best management practices so that we can mitigate um, some of these changes and enhance the native habitat and ecosystem services in, in these areas is, is really what our long-term goal is. It's all yours, Mark. Thanks, Thanks Mark, for uh, interjecting there. That's great. Great point. So looking ahead, um, CMQ5, this is, uh, you know, probably just behind the scenes stuff, but CMQ5 is going to, uh, is kind of our last 
swan song, I guess, as a CMQ5 team. It's going to be incorporated, I think, in the CMQ1. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to call it. But um, so this, you know, based on all the work that we've done as part of this, specifically as part of CMQ5, um, these are some of the uh, looking ahead priorities um, that we came up with that um, we hope we can tackle these directly with the Desert LCC or, or with, a, with a variety of partnerships and probably the latter. But uh, first, uh, based on, at least in part, on some of Amanda's work, uh, um, steer science towards identifying, towards addressing some of the key gaps that Amanda identified as part of her work. And, and really, we're, you know, the questions that we have um, are, are pretty basic, but it would be great to begin looking at quantifying the extent to which riparian fire regimes have changed and to the extent that they have. Um, and like we've been discussing, and as Mark just pointed out, um, the putting in place some of the monitoring to quantify some of the potential impacts of these fires on the resources. So not only on the characteristics of these uh, bottomland systems, you know, soil and water flow or, or chemistry, but also on the ecosystem services they provide. So that's certainly a huge um, priority that we think uh, the Desert LCC is in a good place to at least drive uh, and move forward. Um, it would be great, speaking of uh, monitoring, is to establish a kind of a partnership between teams that are on, in place uh, and are, that are conducting monitoring in one form or another in bottomland ecosystems uh, with the understanding that the monitoring priorities in one, one area of the desert LCC will be different or in one basin will be different than others. But um, I, I feel personally, and I think Amanda and Mark would agree with me, that um, a lot of the times the monitoring is, is be simply because it's not a uh, focused study it's uh, ongoing. It, uh, some, in some cases, it needs to be almost beyond a decadal temporal scale. It often is kind of, uh, you know, it goes from one year to the next uh, below the radar screen. And the more that some of these monitor teams can uh, get above the radar screen and begin to understand what each other are doing, um, maybe even share resources or go after resources together, the, the greater potential is for getting some of this critical monitoring um, uh, continued. Sort of in the same breath, uh, the demonstration sites that we've mentioned, um, which are the sites where severe fire either has occurred or where prescribed fire is being used as a management tool, um, is solidifying that database. And again, I mentioned sort of the interplay of that database between the form and the, the database that's being created for the, uh, being developed for the uh, Rio Grande Water Forum next year. And so continued work on that. And again, the kind of the, the, key, the key questions that, that we have there is, um, you know, it's all well and good to develop a database of, uh, of, of people doing great things uh, in what other, whatever spatial scale that you're dealing with. But the question is, is that we have, you know, in the long term, is where the database will be stored and who can management, manage it. And uh, so there's, there's several uh, possibilities out there, including the Desert LCC, where, where uh, possibilities of that database not only being uh, completed to a certain extent, because to, to a certain extent it will be something that uh, I think I <laughs> no he helped me here. How do I get back? I pressed the button that. Uh, Sorry about that, everybody. Um, yeah, so it, it, just the matter of, of sharing uh, information, I think, will be key in the future with regards to not only the monitoring and the demonstration sites. Um, the other part of the puzzle, as far as uh, we are concerned, and this is certainly true for the parts of you know the, the desert LCC ecoregion that uh, that. Um, uh, goes into Mexico, the Chihuahuan Desert, and, and parts of the Colorado River Basin, but is to continue to enhance our collaboration with Mexico. There are a lot of, um, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but some really key projects that are ongoing where collaboration is not only really deep, but ongoing, and, and, and uh, there's plans to continue it in the future. 
certainly in the Colorado River Delta, um, uh, Big Bend by National Region right along the, the border, the Rio Conchos, uh, Cuatro Cienegas has a great uh, binational program. There's a variety of others that I didn't list here. But I guess the question is how can we learn from these, uh, these projects in terms of what, what were the processes that led to this such deep binational collaboration how, and how potentially Desert LCC can play a role in moving and expanding on, on those efforts. Uh, sort of along the same line, but a little bit different theme is uh, there's some interesting public-private partnerships that are taking place uh, in the Desert LCC um, eco region, and these are efforts that involve uh, uh, public-private uh, entities uh, that focus on specific geographic regions. The Big Bend is a good um, example of that, but, but also there's a variety of other efforts taking place in New Mexico between uh, ranchers and, and the state and the feds, and learning more about how these projects uh, took place and how they're, they're uh, getting funded is going to be key to the future and, and taking advantage of some of these, uh, uh, the private interest in natural resource conservation is going to going to be really critical in the future, fire or otherwise. Uh, it would be great uh, if we can kind of look out at, a, say, a five-year window to convene a conference that might be focused on uh, wildfire, changing fire wired. <laughs> Let me say that again. Uh, changing wildfire regimes in riparian ecosystems. Uh, this is something that potentially could be identified as part of the Rio Grande Water Forum with a water fire kind of uh, context there, but um, getting people together that really know about fire as well as uh, folks that are experts in, in bottomland uh, ecosystems, um, who I think would be uh, a great benefit. So with that, I want to thank uh, Kybe and, and Amanda for all your hard work in this and everybody else that was on a CMQ5 and, and uh, everybody else on the phone no, we and just open up for, for questions. Hey, Mark, I wanted uh, to allude to some of the best management practices that we have come out of our discussions. Um, I think we have some good starting points that, you know, will be taken further through the demonstration sites, but um, a couple that are, are kind of uh, fairly intuitive is, you know, in these areas with mixed ownership and jurisdiction, um, really one of the best management practices we can implement is better fire planning, response, and preparedness. And, and the effort there would really be to work with the local fire departments, volunteer fire departments, and the federal agencies to um, really have better planning so we can keep these fires small. And, uh, you know, the, the, the smaller the, the, these wildfires, the less impact, but also they can provide opportunities for restoration on that finer or smaller scale. Another one would be um, more strategic uh, use of fuel reduction and fuel breaks. Um, we need to get beyond just treating exotics at the grand scale. We need to really look at what sites we can make a difference, where we can create fuel breaks that are accessible from, to the fire uh, response. And um, the shaded fuel break is a great example where we can leave the native vegetation but remove the understory fuels and, and create a place that would be a safe anchor point for fire response. Another one is um, if we do keep the, the wildfires smaller, they are um, opportunities for restoration and we have good techniques that can be used, for example, pole planting to restore the native vegetation um, and function to those sites, and um, typically that is a less flammable, flammable type of vegetation, so it breaks things up and, and overall reduces the size of fires in the long term. And then uh, once again, it's it, you know collaborative efforts. We need to really promote that, the partnerships between the science community, the land managers, working um, across agencies to really take this forward. That was all I wanted to add. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, Mark. Mark. And for anyone else that has a question, uh, if you like, you can press star pound 
to unmute yourself and then you can uh, ask a question directly or you can also chat a question to the group in the, in the everyone box and we can all see it and we'll uh, read that out loud. I guess uh, in the meantime, I had a question about your uh, missing missing pieces discussion. I guess um, how do you see some of the LCC work uh, filling in some of those m missing pieces that you mentioned? Uh, no, are you referring to the the, the last slide before that? Uh, some of the keys there. Yeah, on the inventory and monitoring. Mm-hmm. I think um, one of the practical things, at least in, in my opinion, is is uh, if the Desert LCC could could be the the uh, warehouse for um, some of the data that we're collecting on on the demonstration teams, monitoring teams, whatever we want to call them. I think that would be a huge uh, service. It is. Um, if for anybody who's tried to establish a kind of open public uh, database, there, there's one thing in terms of just sort of the practical uh, parts of establishing it, but there's other in terms of sort of the, the confluence of um, gaining permission and, and uh, for the use of data and, and distribution. And it seems to me the, the Desert LCC could play a vital role there. Right. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, as for your your CMQ5 priorities, um, have you seen the enhanced collaboration between like the the private and, and public sectors that you were looking forward towards? Uh, yeah. Yes, we have. Um, you know, from a World Wildlife Fund standpoint, we've been uh, uh, cooperating really close with uh, several companies. For example, the Coca Cola Company, numerous. Uh, foundations, private foundations, and um, this is a type of collaboration that I think is essential, particularly um, as we think about uh, how to expand on, uh, on cross-agency collaboration. Such private sources are critical for, like, matching funds. So a lot of the, a lot of the you know, just as a small example, a lot of the grants that we're pursuing require um, in some cases, a one-to-one -one match for 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 funding to dollars, private funding dollars to to federal or state, and so that that is a really key part. But the other part too that it that it brings in, of course, is um, you start thinking about uh, working closely with some of these private the, the private sector, and I'm throwing in there not only uh, businesses but also municipalities and and farmers. These these are the big stakeholders in the basin that are that are using um, uh, the water. And uh, as part, you know, obviously we're talking about fire here, but the water is a big part of the picture and how it's managed and what, how much water can actually be provided, when, where, and to what extent to the riparian ecosystem is, is going to determine greatly to what of these issues with invasive species, et cetera, can be addressed in the future. And uh, so that's, that part, I think, is huge, and that's what, at least in part, or maybe as a first step, what the uh, Rio Grande Bravo Forum is trying to do uh, next year, is to bring together um, a lot of the, the, the public and private sector together in one place to talk about water. Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mark. And I see uh, Tim Kirkpatrick is uh, trying to type out a question, but uh, Tim, if you can press star pound, uh, we can... Uh, you can just speak directly into the phone and we can he hear you loud and clear. Great. Uh, does anyone else have any other uh, questions they'd like to ask Mark or Amanda? Or Mark, Mark or Amanda, sorry. <laughs> And uh, I have one more question. Um, I know you, you brought up the, uh, the the database of uh, demonstration sites, and you also want to uh, identify and document some best management practices. Do you see those, like the database, kind of uh, joining the, the, like the BMP documentation, or would they be like separate products uh, in your in your mind? Hey, Kai, do you want to tackle that one? Sorry, I didn't 
catch the end of that question, uh, no? Oh, sure. No. I was just uh, wondering like, uh, the, if your database for demonstration sites and your best management practices, would, would those be separate products or could they be like uh, joined into one, one single product, uh, for example? Well, I think, um, you know, the concept is we develop those more locally um, because uh, every, every one of these river systems is a little bit different, the biophysical setting. And we develop them through the demonstration sites those workshops and meetings, getting that community better connected, have them develop their own, and then make them available through um, the Desert LCC and through some of the workshops that we've proposed. Yeah, and just to add on to that, uh, um, as part of the work related to the Rio Grande Forum, it's really, it's been great to just begin to, this is just in the Rio Grande uh, Bravo Basin, but it's amazing to me um, the number, uh, quality, amount of efforts that are taking place. And you know, at the very least, um, uh, expanding that to the Desert LCC and getting some of, the, of, of these efforts on the radar screen so people can better communicate, I think would be a huge first step. So to answer, I mean, not, at least my opinion, Noe, is, is uh, I mean, the more that we can just have kind of one single database that maybe goes to different, you know, levels of uh, data depth or information depth, but at least get some of these uh, some of these areas and the efforts that are taking place in them on the radar screen would be tremendous. And Noe, I yeah. Think, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to add to that, Mark. I think yeah, that's the bigger long-term picture is to use like the the rain basin as an interactive internet. Um, platform um, so that we can communicate this stuff and, and provide that stuff seamlessly on the internet, the, the, the monitoring data, information, contacts for people, uh, so that, you know, the lessons learned and the monitoring, what we're doing on the lower Colorado River might provide some examples for some of these other river systems. And uh, that's one of the real hurdles we've had um, with the interagency community is that we don't share information um, very readily across these landscape scales. So that's what we're hoping the CMQ and Desert LCC can really help with is setting up that platform so this information data, lessons learned, can be shared more broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great input, Mark. So we have, we have a question from Tim on the chat. Um, he mentions uh, one thing that he's hearing is a need to clarify terminology about fire. Uh, for instance, wildfire, an uncontrolled fire or natural or man-made origin, uh, managed fire, large fire, which is uh, area defined, not flame length, fire breaks, types and extent, and fire prescriptions. Um, do you have any anything to add to Tim? I would have them, him consult uh, one of the uh, fire ecology journals. Um, that information is provided also in numerous uh, fire ecology textbooks and uh, most of that information is, is online but there's some summary articles also and for example the journal of fire ecology all right thanks mark and uh, amy says good job <laughs> and thank you for the webinar uh, are there any other questions that people want to ask or bring up Uh, if not, I would uh, just like to thank everyone for, for participating, and thank you to Mark Briggs, Mark Kybe, and Amanda Webb for taking their time to be with us today. And and uh, as a reminder, uh, the w webinar was recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel, and you can access the channel on the website or, or search for Desert LCC on YouTube, and it will pop up. And once again, just thanks to everyone, and we hope everyone has a great day. Great. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you.